too. I just thought I'd give another little little talk on African American history, which really is Americans' history. It just happened to be done by African Americans, but this affects all of America. This particular talk that I'm on, I'm going to give on is on Ida B. Wells. Now, Ida B. Wells was an early leader in the civil rights movement. She was a journalist and newspaper editor. She wrote and documented on the lynchings that were taking place in the South. She wrote with eloquence and she wrote of the horrors and the evil injustices of black men being lynched by angry white mobs. She was born July 16, 1862, in Holly Springs, Mississippi, six months before the Emancipation Proclamation freed all the slaves in the Confederate States, which meant she was born into slavery. Her father was a carpenter and her mother was a cook. Her father, James Wells, was a hard-working, opinionated man who took an active interest in politics and helping to provide educational opportunities for the newly liberated slaves and his own eight children. He was on the board of trustees of Rust College, which was a freedman school where young Ida B. Wells received a basic education. Ida's mother, Elizabeth Wells, supervised her children's religious training by taking each of her children to church on Sundays and said the only book they could read on Sundays were the Bible. When Ida was 16 and away visiting some relatives, tragedy struck her family. Her parents and some of her brothers and sisters died from a yellow fever epidemic. She either took on the role as mother for her younger brothers and sisters. She was only 16. She knew it was up to her to care for her sisters and brothers. So she came up with a plan to make herself appear older than she actually was by arranging her hair in an adult style and wearing a long dress. Ida was able to get a teaching position by convincing local school officials that she was 18 years old. A few years later, she was able to place some of her older brothers and sisters in teaching positions as apprentices. She later moved to Memphis, Tennessee. There she was able to get a teaching position and further her education at Fisk University. In 1884, while she was traveling by train from school, Wells was forcibly thrown out of a first-class car by the conductor because she refused to ride in the car set aside for African Americans, which was nicknamed the Jim Crow car. Now, she had bought herself a first-class ticket, and she was not going to move. So the white conductor literally dragged her from her seat. All this was happening. The white passengers applauded the conductor for what he did. Wells was determined to fight for justice. She sued the railroad and she won her case. But later the decision was overturned by the Tennessee Supreme Court. This made Wells even more determined to fight for racial injustices wherever she found it. Wells later joined a literary society in Memphis. One of her primary activities was to write essays on various subjects and to read them before the members. Her essays on the social conditions for African Americans were so well received that society members encouraged her to write for church publications. She later was offered a reporting position and part ownership of the Memphis 
Free Speech and Headlight in 1887, which was a newspaper company. She later became the solo owner of that company. Wells was not afraid to speak out against injustices against African Americans, especially in the school system where she worked. She believed the facilities and the supplies to African American children were always inferior to those offered to whites because she told the truth. She lost her teaching position in 1891. In 1892, three of Wells' friends, who were successful black businessmen in Memphis, were killed and the business destroyed by whites, who Wells said was jealous of their success. Wells' newspaper ran an editorial about the murders, and Wells rebuked the white community responsible. While Wells was out of town, an angry mob of whites broke into her newspaper office, broke up her printing presses, and vowed to kill her if she returned to Tennessee. None of these atrocities were done that were done to her stopped her from writing and being a crusader for truth and justice. She eventually moved to Chicago, where she married Frederick Barnett. She continued to write and show America the evils and terrorist activities of lynchings. She never wavered in telling it like it was even with the threat, threats of death. She died in 1931. Her contributions to the city of Chicago were recognized when a public housing development was named her in her honor. And just recently, I believe about a week or so ago, a street in downtown Chicago was named in her honor. It was Congress Parkway, Congress Parkway I believe. Now it's Ida B. Wells. The mayor and many politicians and one of her descendants was there to recognize this honor being bestowed upon her. Ida B. Wells, someone to remember and to be recognized. Like I said, she wrote about the injustices of lynchings that were going on in the South, and she tried to get it to be a federal law from this you know, being taking place. Of course, it was shot down, but she fought and she wrote. And she did this because it needed to be done. And she was the one to do it. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you next time. Bye now.